20 years ago, a friend and I discussed about how much money will make a family feel secure financially. Her family has two children and mine has one. At that time in 2003, we settled on two and a half million dollars. As new immigrants, we didn't even have a hundred thousand dollars and we thought two and a half million dollars was a lot and would be sufficient. Fast forward to today, with soaring housing prices and inflation, that figure should be doubled or tripled. If you ask me now, I might say, if I have $10 million, that will give me a sense of security. But would $10 million guarantee a happy life? When is enough enough? Among the recent unsettling news from the Middle East, the sudden passing of Matthew Perry, the beloved Chandler from Friends at age 54, caught my attention. His wealth must have exceeded $10 million. Why didn't he have a trouble-free life? Perry, as revealed in his memoir, has been craving fame since the beginning of his career, hoping being famous can fix his deep hiding fears of insecurity and abandonment. However, achieving fame and popularity worsened his insecurities. Terrified of maintaining his self-imposed standards, he battled addiction for over 30 years. While sober at the end, it appears he was never truly happy and satisfied throughout his life. When is enough enough? Have you ever noticed that the more you have, the more you want? Many people, including myself, are living from one goal to the next. Life becomes one pursuit after another, lacking the joy and contentment because there is never enough. Jesus came to show us a different way. The gospel offers an alternative to the endless pursuit for something more. It teaches us that it is possible to be content regardless of our circumstances, because through the gospel, we learn Jesus Christ is the only source of lasting satisfaction. When you truly understand who Jesus is and what he offers, you will find Jesus is the bread of life. We are now on our second week in John chapter 6, and as the crowds are chasing satisfaction, Jesus explains he is the bread of life and he alone offers lasting satisfaction in this life. This week is a continuation of the story from last week's story where Jesus fed a miracle chasing crowd of more than 5,000 people. They are following Jesus because they saw the signs and wonders. And sure enough, Jesus did not disappoint them because he fed the crowd before he withdrew from the crowd. And now the crowd is chasing Jesus again. That's where we pick up the story. John chapter 6 verses 22 through 40 breaks into three divisions. In the first division, the crowd is seeking bread, not Jesus, verses 22 to 27. And in the second division, Jesus explains the crowd is needing Jesus, not bread, verses 28 to 36. And in the third division, the crowd is learning Jesus satisfies, verses 37 to 40. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 6. And in verses 22 to 27, we see the crowd that Jesus fed with five loaves and two fish the day before finally found Jesus in Capernaum. They knew Jesus did not get on the boat with the disciples. They did not see Jesus walked on the water. So they were confused how Jesus traveled to the other side of the lake. Curious and hungry, they asked, Rabbi which means teacher, 
when did you get here? But Jesus, who knows the hearts and motives of all people, says in verse 26, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. It turns out this crowd isn't seeking Jesus. They are seeking bread. They are looking for fast, free food. In a show of grace, Jesus, instead of being offended by their motives, takes the opportunity to teach the crowd. Instead of dismissing the people because their motives are wrong, he redirects their efforts and highlights the futility of what they're doing. Verse 27 says, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the sign of man will give you. Jesus warns the crowd that their pursuit never ends. Temporary pursuits, such as to work for food that spoils, only offer temporary pleasures. They are short-lived pursuits that never bring satisfaction. It isn't wrong to eat a meal each day. Our bodies were made to need food but to chase the meal or the provision of the meal as the ultimate thing is to never be satisfied. Jesus offers an alternative to temporary pursuits. He offers food that endures to eternal life. The physical food we eat every day brings nourishment and satisfaction to our bodies temporarily. Jesus offers food that brings lasting nourishment and satisfaction now and eternally. Jesus offers the nutrients and sustenance we need for this life and the life to come. And this isn't about our stomach. It is about our hearts. Jesus, the son of man, is inviting the crowd to true contentment and satisfaction that they can have now and will endure into eternal life. Before we judge this crowd, let's ask ourselves, are we like them? There are entire theologies built on seeking Jesus for what he can do, not for who he is. This crowd chased him for what he could do with five loaves and two fish. But let's ask, why are we here studying the Bible? Is it because we're expecting him to fix all our problems, heal all our diseases, and take away our pain? Jesus would say those are temporary fixes. It really pierces my heart when I reflect about myself. I am one of those who are chasing food and expecting Jesus to support their pursuit. Climbing the corporate ladder without any satisfaction or appreciation where God has placed us and why he has placed us there. Sacrificing our families and homes and marriages to make more money. Chasing food that spoils. All while calling Jesus rabbi. Acting like we want the teaching, but when it gets right down to it, we're just after a meal. What Jesus is trying to teach the crowd is this truth, and which is also our first principle. Seeking Jesus for who he is, is the only eternally satisfying pursuit. Seeking Jesus for who he is, is the only eternally satisfying pursuit. I have heard many testimonies of successful scientists, bankers, medical doctors, business people, successful and wealthy individuals, gave up their careers and highly respected social status, answering God's call, become missionaries and pastors, sharing the gospel in places far from their comfortable home or shepherding God's people in their communities. Their only work and desire is to walk alongside people so that they can know Christ. The bread of life offered them something that would never perish, spoil, or fade. 
If Jesus were standing before us today, what would he identify as our true pursuit? Why am I chasing a better job? Why am I chasing a new title? What am I mad about? Because Jesus isn't meeting my expectation and is instead inviting me to go deeper and feast on him. Jesus is inviting us to lay down the temporary pursuits of this life and seek him for something deeper and longer lasting. Now Jesus has pointed out the crowd is seeking bread, not Jesus. Jesus then explains in the second division to the crowd what their need is Jesus, not bread. Jesus told them to work for food that endures, and that sparks the crowd's curiosity in verses 28 and 29. What must we do to do the work God requires? In other words, they said, tell us the work that's required for that kind of food, and we will do it. But the answer isn't what they expect, because Jesus answers, the work of God is to believe in the one he has sent. The crowd must have been puzzled by this answer. The work is to believe. Is that a real work? What does that mean? Jesus means the work is to have a continual and growing belief in the one he has sent. Believe he is who he says he is. Trust him. You might be thinking that isn't work and that will be exactly the point. What God is looking for is faith or trust, not work. Jesus is inviting his listeners into a continual and growing belief in who he is. And while the crowd may have been confused, we don't have to be. We have the scriptures in their fullness. Salvation and eternal life isn't something you work for or earn. It is granted by faith in Jesus, the Son of Man, the bread of life, the one whom God has sent. That is to believe in him is to know eternal satisfaction. Believing in Jesus is accompanied by transformation of life. Believing is deep inside the heart, but not on the surface only. It is not just saying, I believe in Jesus, but live however I want to live, say and do whatever I want to say or do. We must truly understand who Jesus is and let him be the master of our lives. Jesus says the work is to believe, believe in the one he has sent. But the crowd started a negotiation. They asked, what sign will you give us? Show us something, Jesus, you know, like Moses, who gave our ancestors bread from heaven. They're still chasing a meal. Feed us, Jesus, and that will prove it. But Jesus, who knows the motives of all people, graciously continues to teach them. Jesus explains, it wasn't Moses who supernaturally provided bread in the desert. Verse 32, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The crowd expected Jesus to magically give food to them every day, just like the daily manna God gave them in the wilderness in Moses' days. But they seemed to forget why God gave them bread from heaven in the first place. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3 says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years, to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding your manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. God gives them manna, 
bread from heaven. So they would learn about their need for God himself. So they would look to God. Jesus is doing the same thing. He gave them bread so they would learn about their need for him, not their need for bread. God gave them manna to prepare them to receive Jesus, the bread of life, when he comes. Even the manna pointed to Jesus. But the crowd still thinks this is about bread. So they ask in verse 34, Sir, give us this bread. And Jesus, who has led them to this point, makes a promise in verse 35 and 36. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you have seen me, and you still do not believe. Jesus is saying, I am the true bread of heaven. I have come from God. I am God. I am the one who gives life to the world. Jesus can offer true and lasting satisfaction. There's no lasting satisfaction to be found apart from Jesus. But our cultures are dangerously working against this truth. Advertising and marketing are about helping you realize all your unmet needs. Climbing the corporate ladder is about chasing more. Social media is a tool we invite into our home to remind us that we are missing out on things. Everything in our culture seems to be working against the truth, and even professing believers seem to not be ever satisfied. I am so grateful that this lesson really speaks to my heart. Matthew Perry did not find satisfaction in his life. How about myself? It can happen to all of us. A promotion, a goal you want your spouse to achieve, renovation of your home, the frustration when your kids aren't making more of the opportunities they have been given. While these are not inherently bad or good, when we ask them to deliver in ways they were never meant to, we will never be satisfied. Jesus says, come to him, take him in. As deliberately as we would take and eat a piece of bread, take him in. We do that in our profession of belief, and we do that as the daily practice of life. Christ is the answer to the emptiness. Christ satisfies the relentless pursuit for something new. This is not a promise that if you believe in Jesus, you will have everything you want. This is a promise that when you believe in Jesus, you will have the spiritual strength you need to continue the life and work he has for you. And this is our second principle. Feasting on Jesus provides the spiritual strength to do the work he has for you. Feasting on Jesus provides the spiritual strength to do the work he has for you. We have so much junk food in our lives, candy, soft drinks, and everyone knows that if you fill up on those things, you will be malnourished. But can we discern the spiritual junk food in our lives? Attention, attraction, applause, recognition, Jesus isn't just inviting the crowds to feast on him. He's inviting us back to the table today. Come and feast on him. Can we lay down our constant hunger for whatever it is and ask him to satisfy us? It is not wrong to want to make something out of this life. It is not wrong to make a lasting impact in the lives of others. It is not wrong to go on vacation or watch a sporting event. But if that's where our hope and satisfaction lies, we will never be satisfied. Now we come to our third division, learning Jesus satisfies. Verse 37 through 39 describe what it means to be received and secured. And those the Father gives me will come to me. 
and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up in the last day. Those who come to Jesus and receive him are secured. God gives the world Jesus. God gives Jesus people who will feast on him. No one gets lost in the process. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. This concept is called the doctrine of election. We can find the definition of election in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Election means God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Election is a mind-stretching doctrine because we understand election in human terms. When we elect someone to office, we are choosing one over another, often based on some merits in the person. However, God's divine election is not based on merits. Election is an undeserved gift from God rather than a deserved reward for our spiritual accomplishments. There is mystery surrounding God's election of his people. On the one hand, because God chose to adopt us before creation, there is nothing we need or can do to earn his favor. And on the other hand, election does not negate our responsibility to receive Christ for salvation. We need to believe. And that's what makes election hard to dissect and fully understand. But we can entrust the miseries of election to the wisdom of our incomprehensible and trustworthy God. We can take our questions to him God is working in a way to draw people to himself and to give them eyes to see so they can believe. When we believe in election, we find it deeply encouraging because anyone can be saved. It is all about grace. It is not about them reforming. When we don't believe in election, we will always question God's knowledge and wisdom in his judgment. Election isn't meant to discourage us. It's actually meant to comfort us. We rest assured and secure in the hands of the Father, grateful to the Son and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We experience comfort, security, peace, and freedom as God's child. We are given eternal life by God's design. We share the gospel with confidence, knowing that the salvation of others depends on God's work, not our eloquence. Jesus trusts that God will accomplish his will in salvation, and that is what election means for us. Verse 40, for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. Everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. What is eternal life? Is it life in perpetuity? It just lasts forever? No, eternal life is a new, vibrant, and lasting quality of life. Eternal life means new eyes, new heart, new hungers, new perspectives, new tastes, new loves, new hopes, and new peace. Eternal life is life where all things are new, not solved or fixed, but new, fresh, different, and it is not disrupted by death. So here comes our third and last principle today. Jesus can and does offer lasting satisfaction to those who believe in him. Jesus can and does offer lasting satisfaction to those who believe in him. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine tells us, our Lord is patient, 
He does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance and be saved. Jesus invites people to feast on him. This is the only solution for everyone. When I heard about Matthew Perry's passing, I wished that he was saved because only Jesus can save him out of his struggles. But isn't that true for every one of us? We all have unachieved goals that make us less satisfied, making us always wanting more. Why are we settling for lesser things instead of feasting on Jesus? Jesus, the bread of life, offers the lasting satisfaction, not only for which the whole world longs, but also for the longings of our hearts today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your one and only Son, Jesus, to the world as the bread of life, to give us true satisfaction that will last forever. Thank you, Jesus, for sacrificing yourself on the cross, for cleansing us with your precious blood. May your Holy Spirit give us a humble heart, always be hungry for your word, and transform our lives and mold us to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.